These are the myths and these are the facts. I think we need to work on facts. And my view is these are all myths that we need to challenge. I wonder if what she, the advice that she might offer to her friend might be different to how she's engaging with her own challenge. For example, society expects you to see your baby and you have an instant bond and you are a mother. And for some women, it's not like that. Hello and welcome to Perspectives, a series from Prari where we talk all about key issues in mental health and addictions today. I'm Colin Quick and I'm Priory's Chief Quality Officer and today we're going to be talking about women's mental health and the challenges that that brings across society. Now today I'm joined on a panel by Priory's Therapy Director Debbie Longsdale, Consultant Psychiatrist Dr Victoria Chamorro and Consultant Psychiatrist and Medical Director Dr Samir Shah. Hi everyone. So just to kind of put some context around this to start with before we start having some more discussion around this, um, research tells us that around one in five women will experience some form of, of mental health problem, uh, common mental health disorder like anxiety or depression in their lifetime, and that compares to around about one in eight for men. So I guess the first question is why? So. Victoria, we'd love to hear your view on, on why, is, why is that, why is the difference? Well, I think there's, there's, there's a number of reasons and I think one of the reasons is women are more likely to seek help. So we're not really sure what the true number, for example, of people, because there's a big residual amount of people that don't seek help. Um, and I think men are less likely because of the stigma around mental health to be able to seek help than women, which is a very sad thing. I think also um, the reason it's so prevalent is because of the challenges that women face nowadays. I think there is a lot of uh, psychological factors, very biological factors um, about being a woman with a, with a cycle, um, all the menstrual issues, fertility issues, and then all the mental health around the baby um, and having a baby, um, all the way through to menopause. So there's some real strong biological factors, not just uh, the kind of physical sense that, that men don't necessarily go through. Now, there's a, there's a really interesting piece in, in The Guardian relatively recently that was a survey of, of um, psychiatrists, um, and they found that there were a sort of top three issues that were contributing to, to women's poor mental health, and that was around abuse and violence, relationship issues, and home and family pressure. Now, Victoria, you talked a little bit about that, mm -hmm. but, but Samir, from a, from a consultant psychiatrist's point of view, how prevalent do you see that in your practice? Is that something that those factors are really quite common? Uh, they are pretty common. and more than what we think it would be. For example, uh, nearly more than, nearly 50% of women patients who come into clinics for mental health difficulties talk about abuse, trauma, violence, or being subjected to some form of coercive uh, uh, abuse within their So it's a very, very uh, topical, and in my view, a significant part of how it affects their mental health. The Second most, uh, I think, which is there, is of course the whole life cycle that women have to go through, which Victoria has very, uh, uh, you know, has sum summed it up in just uh, one sentence from start to finish. Uh, and there are biological differences that also affect uh, women. However, it can be protective as well, but if you have other vulnerabilities like trauma, abuse, uh, it can really uh, not add, but multiply the effects uh, of that. Along with that, we also have societal pressures, what we expect of women to do, or men to do, uh, and that directly or indirectly also puts pressure on the women themselves of what they expect of how they should be within the society as well, whether it's at, uh, in their workplace, whether it's home, whether uh, it's elsewhere. So I think it's a, multiple, a multitude of factors. Of course, there's genetic vulnerability as well, so when you combine all of those together, it's, uh, there are multiple factors that affect the women uh, differently to any other genders. Really interesting. We'll, we'll come to that piece around the genetic factors in a minute as well. Debbie, I'd really love to, to hear your view. In terms of that piece of work around sort of relationship issues, expectations on, on women, in that kind of sense of their role in the household, from your practice, what, what do you see? What are those sort of factors that you're seeing every day? 
Yeah, I think it's um, a really big part of what we see in the therapy room um, in terms of expectations, which may have may have evolved over families. So in terms of what you saw your own mother or grandmother do and therefore what you think you should be doing as a female. Um, I think that the, um, I don't want to sort of generalise too much, but I think gen <laughs> generally, um, women are expected to juggle more things in, in the household, even if you're holding down a full-time job as well. So I think that it's separating out and understanding what am I expecting myself to do, what is society thinking I might do, um, and how that's impacting my relationships and breaking it all down. But there's definitely, we see a really big theme around that in the therapy room. Right, okay. Um, so I mentioned earlier on, I want to come back to that issue around genetics. and and. So you mentioned about it, but I'd really be interested again to get your view on that, Victoria. What does that what does that mean to us? What does that mean to our kind of for our viewers today to understand that sort of genetic differences and how that might impact on someone's mental health? Yeah, I think um it's very interesting because I think there's epigenetic and also genetic factors. So if you think about DNA, DNA is the kind of necklace with the pearls on it. Um epigenetics is how that DNA is then folded. And what we know about things like trauma is it goes back three generations. So um, my grandmother would have carried my mother, obviously, and her eggs would have been formed in my grandmother's womb. So that would have affected the epigenetic changes of the eggs, which obviously affect how I am born. So trauma does affect three generations back. Um, so things like anxiety, even if the genetic structure is not changed in itself, it can be changed in that folding. Um, and therefore be inheritable, even though it's not kind of DNA structured, which I think shows how complex this issue is and a reason that we can't necessarily identify particular genes all the time for particular mental health issues. Um, and one of the reasons we haven't got things like a DNA test to see whether you'll get anxiety or depression or anything like that, because there are multi multifactorial reasons, essentially. But there is a strong, should we say, family element, genetic element to a lot of mental health um, conditions. Um, one of the biggest predictors of if you will have perinatal mental health issues, for example, is whether your mother and grandmother suffered from perinatal issues. Um, and for example, conditions like bipolar have a very strong genetic element to them, while something like depression, anxiety probably has a less strong correlation that obviously is all impacted by it. And I guess that there's a piece as well for us to really like to have a bit of discussion. There are unique stages of life that women go through, which have unique challenges associated with them. So I'll just pick up some of those and just thoughts and views about how they impact on, on um, potentially on someone's mental health. So uh, Debbie, I'm going to come to you just to talk through the impact of pregnancy. What's that like for a woman's mental health and their well-being overall? How does that impact? Mm -hmm. I was just thinking about adopted people, actually, when you're talking about genetics as well and how maybe not everybody even has that that story and the impact of that. And and, and pregnancy, um, I mean, huge. I, I have given birth to two children, so I have been through that, and it was a very interesting experience. Um, and I think the hormonal impact um, and the support system you have around you and what you eat and all of the other ingredients that go into um managing that that life stage is is really quite huge um and interestingly the people that that wanted to have a baby who can't have a baby will also have um a mental health reaction to being with their i remember say so i was in my late 20s and, and i had a friend who wasn't able to conceive and 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 all the people around her were getting pregnant and the impact that had on her mental health was actually quite huge I um, my my career when I was in my twenties was in banking, and and actually I was a bank manager in my twenties. I wasn't even working in mental health, and and the impact of being pregnant twice had a huge impact on my career. So I think there are so many little kind of arms and legs that grow in terms of the impact on on you as a a human being, as a female, your role in society, the expectations then around how you then engage with that with that. Um, pregnancy and looking after the baby, looking after yourself. There are so many things to think about. Um, and there is the part of the education. So I remember buying the books and educating myself, but there's also the, okay, you should do this, you must do that. And there is so much information that can be overwhelming. Um, so I think it can be 
a really complex time for people's mental health if, if they maybe haven't learned to manage what information they respond to mm. as well. So um, a very individual response, yeah. And a great deal of misinformation as well, I right. find. Yeah. I think a lot of expectation, especially out giving birth, is a lot of, or some women think they're going to have this green goddess back to nature experience. Yeah. And it's the reality is not necessarily like them. I mean, it is for some women, but not for the vast majority of women. So there's kind of managing expectations through that period too. Mm, sure. and, and then breastfeeding and having a baby and that sort of thing too. In the pregnancy period, just, just to comment about domestic abuse, it actually increases. So when a woman is going through these life stages and is more vulnerable, you'd think that people would be more protective. The reverse is true and the rates of domestic abuse massively skyrocket. Um, so it, it is really important that that's involved in any consultation around that period that you're asking about those sorts of things. Um, for example, thinking of a very one that always chimes very heavily with me when I meet mothers that have this, loving your baby is not necessarily an instant thing. And I think, for example, society expects you to see your baby and you have an instant bond and you are a mother. And for some women, it's not like that. And that's okay, that's normal. Um, but you can imagine the amount of guilt, shame, sadness, not necessarily expressing that to doctors, to their partners, that actually they have this creature that they are now the life support for, that they don't feel love for, or it feels like a different kind of love than they were used to. And for the vast majority of women, that is gone. You know, they, they, they bond, but it's not that kind of instant bird hatching uh, in, uh, thing that we all expect women to experience. You have to learn to be a mother, and that's that's tough. And society does not, it's kind of, you might be a bad mum kind of surfaces very quickly. Samir, I'd be very fascinated to get your view about, again, what you're seeing in clinical practice um, of women that you're seeing in sort of perimenopausal or menopausal phases as well. And I guess it's that, what do they experience from a, from a mental health and well-being point of view? And again, that impact of what that means for society's expectations and how that might be impacting on them. Really... Uh, the challenges here are, uh, what I see in my practice is, if someone has got serious mental illness already, uh, such as severe depression, bipolar, or psychosis, uh, including ADHD and others, there are very classic relapse periods uh, of them. And one of them is just around perimenopausal and then just at the end of perimenopausal phase because there's a sudden drop in the estrogen uh, levels, progesterone levels, and fluctuations. And there are physical as well as psychological effects. Uh, at the same time, there are changes in the liver metabolism because of the way the estrogen works around as well. So the way they might have been stable on certain medications, but they are not sufficient enough around that time. And we see quite a number of uh, admissions around that, those periods around that. So understanding the biological changes along with what stresses and pressures are put in, uh, that individual is put under mm -hmm. allows us to really support them better uh, with that. But the expectations that society puts on them during those times, saying it's normal, it is normal, but it does have its impact and it does need some lifestyle modification changes, support put in place. At the same time, women thinking uh, there's shame, there's guilt, uh, there is denial and in many cases they're dismissive or society is dismissive of their problems or minimizing them they all add to the burden that they already have with that so these are the phases i would say pregnancy more or less fine as long as managed it's mainly just after delivery perimenopausal which could actually go on to about eight to ten years before they are even fully menopausal, and then menopause interestingly a year or two years after menopause, we see a drop in the mental health uh, problems. Uh, there's less anxiety, less depression, less of the other challenges they have. So there is a lot going on biologically, psychologically, but I think a massive contribution is society because we add on to that. May I add a point to that? Of course, yeah. So when we're talking about dismissive society, I also think that science in general has been dismissive of perimenopausal. You know, pregnant women are very valued by society and there's a lot of research into that. When you look at the menopausal research, mm -hmm. there's there's hardly yeah. any. Um, and it's it's a very odd place to be because obviously half the <laughs> half the population are going to go through it. Um, 
I mean, I hear all the time it's natural, it's normal, but so is death. And we don't expect people to manage that sort of thing on their own. So um, there's a lot of evidence to say that women's menopausal symptoms are dismissed by the health professionals. And I think that's, that's twofold, partly because we don't understand it, uh, not fully, partly because we don't have proper treatments for it, not effective, not as effective as we'd like. Um, and so the individual healthcare um, doesn't really know what to offer. So the easiest thing sometimes is trying to minimise work with a patient and narrative rather than kind of give true treatments targeted towards the menopausal period. Yeah, but along with that is uh, absolutely spot on there. But uh, if you look at our criteria for diagnosis, of course, if you look at diagnostic systems, you know, within psychiatry and others, they some of them are not geared to how women would present in terms of their mm. symptoms, like the depression they would present versus or how men would present. There are some criteria that don't fit the men fully uh, as well. So I think our criteria of research is also at times not uh, specific. Mm -hmm. uh, but also when we do research purely for particular gender or uh, sex or other aspects, they become very exclusive and they cannot be generalized either. So we need a different form of research. And I think in the last de in the past decade or so, we are seeing more and more of naturalistic uh, studies, naturalistic research. That's why we are here talking about it uh, and, and identifying what areas of life do individuals need a more evidence-based support uh, rather than just say they're just unwell. Mm -hmm. the, the one that was also really interesting, all three of you have mentioned it as you've gone along, and it's interesting because it's a theme that we've had in, in other episodes that we've done of perspectives, was all around society and how society view things. And one of those elements that I think has come through as a really strong theme is about the impact of social media and how the presentation and the expectations on individuals have, I think they, they definitely have always been there, but they almost seem to now become into a much more of a microscope. So I just want to kind of get the panel's view on that. Maybe I'll start with yourself, Debbie, your, your view of the, the impact of social media on, on women's mental health. Yeah, huge, I guess is the short answer. Um... It's very idealistic, it's very filtered, it's very full of um, expectations and and if you're anywhere watching somebody on Instagram or any other platform uploading information, it's 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 kind of it's not real. It's it's filtered. It's it's the positioning what they think people um, should see of them. So I so it's not true life. You don't it's not a balanced view of an individual. Um, and um, it does create pressure and people that are vulnerable, so going back to the biological stage of people, if they're feeling um, vulnerable biologically or there's something happened in their life that's making them more vulnerable and then you are exposed to this filtered version of what life could look like, I think it can have a really complicated impact on people. Um, and, and the materialistic element of what we should have in our lives can put a lot of pressure on people and that can compromise how people then live their lives to generate the money to pay for things. And um, so I think that it's quite, again, we have to filter ourselves, what we, what we expose ourselves to, but it's there and, it, and it's, it's difficult to not see it and it's difficult to not understand it. And, and it's in the news and people talk about it and it's been commercialized. So lots of um, companies that piggyback on the back of it and then they advertise things because people have lots of followers. So I think it's got so many layers to it that we don't always even realize that that is what's influencing us. It's kind of entwined now, it's an ingredient we can't, we can't take out of the mixture. Um, so um, yeah, I think it has a huge impact on people. Okay. Yeah, I think with social media, uh, agree. It's got both sides, it's about two sides of the same coin uh, with it. But the impact I say most or learn, even from my patients or colleagues and others, is on the young people mm. because they still haven't uh, fully grasped what is right, what is not, what is control. And that's possibly leading to, and especially uh, girls, because we're seeing higher rates of self harm, higher rates of uh, eating related behaviors, higher rates of uh, lower self-esteem and others because the expectation that's put on that area, it's very difficult for them to absorb. Uh, but also utilizing the social media without, as you said, unfiltered. But, and that's a lot more common with the younger people. Uh, but what's also happening, what we are noticing and maybe we'll learn more in 10 years time is 
everything is shot bites. And when you do that, there's a sudden dopamine surge and dopamine release. And to get the same level of gratification by regular routine tasks that we do, which is live, it's not possible. So I'm, whole, I'm looking at, are we going to have a new generation who is more into instant gratification, mm. immediate rewards, mm. uh, impulsivity, uh, and also is it going to increase anxiety, depression, and all the other mental health problems that we have seen so far, but at a much, much higher scale uh, than we have seen now. That is more of my concern with social media and unfiltered versions. And I guess that this, I think this actually works really nicely. This, this brings us to that kind of next discussion point because we talked earlier on about the experiences of people. So that experience of when you're looking to seek help, when you're looking for support, when at the right time. And I just want to reference a, a, a YouGov poll uh, that was taken of women who discussed about their, their own mental health crises that they may have had. And when they sought help, 33% um, were overtly asked, do you think you're just overthinking things? 27% were told, it's probably just hormonal. 20% were told they were being dramatic. Now, I really, there's some really difficult statements in there. Um, and I, I worry as a, as a health professional that people are asking those questions or, or how they're being put. So I want to get your, your views on it. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the sort of things that we should be looking out for. So let's just go along the panel. So Samir, your, your views about some of those statements and some of those numbers in there. Overthinking, being dramatic is just hormonal or even asking, you know, oh, just don't bother that person. They might be in that time of the month, uh, you know, just assumptions. I think we make these assumptions when uh, we are not working on the basis of science or the evidence or the facts. The overthinking, dramatization, hormonal has a very, very good science underneath, uh, which is it's not that they're choosing to think or become obsessive others. It's because there are changes. And by having these assumptions, we are just making it harder for them. Yes, it's a natural part of the journey, but we are adding burden to that. So we got genes, stress and environment. So genes we can't change. Of course, we can minimize the impact on them. Uh, stress, we can work with it and develop coping skills. The environment is what we build for mm -hmm. people. And I think that is what we have done. We have created an environment like that. For example, when we talked about the young people, the first experience that a girl gets is between the age of 10, 13, or when they get the very first period, which is a menarche, we call it. The moment they hit that episode, the depression and anxiety rates is double to their male or the boys, straight. Now that is not over-dramatization. That's not making things up. That's not uh, hormone. That is hormonal, but along with that, if you add pressures, it goes on. And that continues till menarche and only settles after menopause with that. So it's not dramatization. Uh, uh, and we need to support uh, and we need to challenge these assumptions that we have. So even for you, uh, you know, the poll to suggest that without a counter to that saying you think this way, but these are the facts. These are the myths and these are the facts. I think we need to work on facts. And mm -hmm. our, my view is these are all myths that we need to challenge. Well, I think that well-known philosopher Taylor Swift said it very well when she said that uh, men show leadership and women are bossy. Uh, and I think women struggle with that when they when they hit 18 or 16 or whenever society decides that they are women, they try and get shoehorned into a role which largely equates to be smaller, you know, don't take up so much room. And I think that's, that's quite a, diff a, a difficult thing for anyone to go through. And it's one of the unique challenges of, of, of being a woman. Um, in the same breath, I don't want to say there's not unique challenges of being a man, because there absolutely is. Mm -hmm. But um, the female ones definitely need a spotlight on them too. Um, and and it's, it's a very tricky thing for someone to, to navigate and it might interfere with accessing help um, and getting their mental health addressed and talking to their families, especially as the younger generations are generally more mentally health savvy than the older generations. It's quite difficult to rely on family units to be able to, which is generally people's first port call. 
so we've talked a lot about the experiences of, of women at different stages of life, the challenges, the impact that that has on them, the impact that it has on their, on their mental health and well-being. But I think like any of, the, of uh, our programmes, we want to make sure that we're really also talking about, okay, so what? Actually, what does that mean? How do we make sure that we can give some really good advice about how to make sure you can um, support someone, support yourself, look at the how to use the, the system around you as well? And you know, obviously, we've been indicating that sometimes that system has some challenges within it. The, the terminology and the way that it's set up doesn't always have a true understanding of, of women's needs within that system. So I just want to kind of go along. I think I've got two questions. I'm going to sort of telegraph both of them so the panel can think about them. One is from your professional practice, what is it that as a as a health system we can do differently and better to support women? And then the second question is about for for our advice to our to our viewers is around if you are a woman or you're supporting someone, how can you make the best use of that system as well? How are those things? You know, we shouldn't have to adapt systems, but we're in that position at the moment where, where sometimes we have to. Um, so let's start. Sumit, from you, first of all, you know, what is it that as a, as a health system we can do better to support women? So Colin, really interesting question, and I think it's a question that a lot of us are trying to answer or come up with a plausible uh, way of working. And for many decades, we know how many reorganisations in healthcare systems we had within Eng in England, in UK and across the world. Uh, I don't think anyone has got it right. Uh, but I think we do need a healthcare system where kindness, compassion, and curiosity are the day-to-day uh, -day ingredients. Doesn't matter which healthcare professional is involved in it, because asking the empowering questions gives us better responses and answers to work with. Uh, I also think we need a healthcare system which is integrated, which means collaborative. It includes if I if we take about England or United Kingdom. Uh, primary care, secondary care, acute mental health, independent sectors, charities, all working together with a common goal, rather than having this fragmented pieces of work, because everyone's doing a great job. It's just that they're not coming together. Just by coming together, we possibly might get what we call as a holistic healthcare system, which is not only right for the person or the individual who's accessing it, but it's great for the communities, people, but also economically, it might be more better and manageable than what we are doing now. Uh, but to do that, we need the right sort of people coming together. And what we're also missing in that, for that collaborative working in all these pieces, are patients and their voices, and carers and their voices. We do have their representation, but they are the select few. We need a large amount, a large groups of people to come into. I think that's when a uh, healthcare system will be sustainable, manageable, and possibly we'll be able to address all these myths that we are talking about and empower every individual, no matter uh, where they come from or what age or stage of their life they are in as well. Over to you, Victoria. How, do, how does the system do it better? How do we do it at the point of delivery to really work to a woman's needs? So I think Samir has made some very good points about the structural changes, but I also think there's some quite low-lying fruit that could be addressed. Um, when you say polls like what you mentioned earlier about women being dramatic when they come for help, um, that feels like that should be of a bygone era. I mean, I feel like treating women as individuals before they're women necessarily while uh, appreciating the unique challenges that they undergo um, I think would would be a real step forward um, I think identifying that women have the majority of the caring uh, roles in society and so actually if you care for women you're caring for a whole glue of society that otherwise you wouldn't have access to uh, and you wouldn't be able to support is, is very important to appreciate um, so I feel that there is you know, uh, a, a void in kind of uh, respect for women's problems um, at a kind of very grassroots level, all the way up through uh, the areas of science, really, and getting more female research. And so what I'd say to a woman who's desperately trying to get help and she's had an unhelpful response from whatever service she has um, approached is to persevere. I mean, there are people desperately that want to help you, um, and please do persevere and, and get through the generally just barriers of entry because there are so many people that need help. Um, but yes, there are services and they do desperately want to help. Debbie, I mean, you, you 
you support and run our, our therapy services across the, the whole of the UK. What do your services do now that really helps support someone, support a woman to come in to, to, to receive treatment in a way that they feel very included? I think it's trying to <clears throat> connect with what people are looking for um, and meet them where they are. So it's allowing them to have the voice of where they are now and the belief and the hope that, that things can change. So we, we make that open to people as much as we can. Um, I think that, that women only in our inpatient settings and some outpatient settings as women only groups because then you can have that like-minded conversation and support each other and and hopefully they can feel empowered to um, share their specific um, issues with it with another female and that that's proven to be really helpful um, and I think that it's allowing people to also have a choice around the, the kind of treatment they're looking for so we don't want to pigeonhole people you know in terms of someone comes in for a referral and we triage and we say okay you need modality cbt whatever it may be it's thinking about okay what what's this person's journey what balancing the nice guidelines with what person's person's needing is it more relational and, and factoring that in as well so not being checklisty about the kind of, of treatment we offer somebody, trying to customise that. And that's why we're making sure all the staff that are doing the triaging are really well experienced in this area. Um, so it, it's to, back to what you were saying about treating people as individuals, um, but meeting them where they are now and making it OK to be where you are. And then we'll work with you from there. Um, that's what we're aiming to do. OK, so. I want to bring us back to that second question that we asked about, which is around how um, someone can support themselves, the things that they need to, to look out for maybe, about whether their, their, their mental health is, is challenged or there's certain times of, of life that things might get challenging and the things to look out for, but also how someone who cares for them, who's looking out for them, also how do they understand and know the things to look out for. And I guess that some of that is about, uh, the, as I say, the things to look out for, the, the basic things that you can do to support good mental health and well-being. Um, but also, I think some of those challenges of the differences in the way things might get diagnosed or the way things might get shown as well. So I'm going to come back along the panel in the same order so everyone's had the same chance to, to think about it. So Samir, over to you first of all. Uh, how one can support themselves or others can support them, uh, who are not health professionals, let's uh, think about that. Uh, I think in my view the first thing is we have to become completely objective or basically not judge uh, what's going on. Uh, so one of the patients actually told me that uh, he, uh, this person loves their family because they say what they see. Uh, so they're not making assumptions, they're not making judgments, they'll just say, I see you're very angry, tell me. And they say, I'm not angry and I can explain. So they're not judging. So one is the most important for the person themselves not to judge themselves and not allow anybody else to judge them. So being objective uh, resolves quite a lot of issues. Uh, but the second thing for others to support women or those who are suffering or having difficulties uh, uh, is just to sit and listen just to say, I'm here, but at the, at the individual's terms. They may not want to talk, they may just want you to be around them, or they may want to talk. So just giving them that space helps them, mm -hmm. uh, validates that the environmental part we talked about and the stress minimizes, uh, despite other changes that might be going on. Uh, but then it's also for others to know that they are not there to treat this person. Then there's no expectation that they make a positive difference in that individual's life at that point of time. All their purpose is to be there and just listen or be there so the person feels supported. So that takes the pressure off the others because society puts that pressure on themselves at times because unless you have cured something, you haven't done anything, which is incorrect. Uh, but I think other the critical part to that is to encourage people who need help to go and access help. Sometimes just encouragement doesn't work because if many of the women were able to, or other people were able to access help, they would have done it. Sometimes it's encouragement, sometimes it's nudging them a little bit, sometimes it's about giving them the support and saying, this is the support available to you uh, as well, but not leaving it because that is a very critical piece, I think. Uh, and, and just educating ourselves to the facts rather than what society and we all have uh, or what media 
tells us. Okay, well, I guess like any of us, isn't it? So Victoria, your, your views? I suppose to add on from what you said, because I agree with everything that Samir has mentioned, is I suppose lifestyle factors that you can do to improve your kind of mental wellness. Um, um, these are often things that are missed, especially from a medical point of view, because we're very keen to, to kind of help as much as we possibly can. But things like um, diet, getting enough fruit and vegetables, I know these are kind of very boring, basic things, but they really, the evidence is showing it makes a huge difference. We now have a lot of science to say that actually changes the gut bacteria, which really affects your mental health. Doing things like getting outside in, in the morning, that can make a, a massive big difference to your mental health having some time for yourself. And I think a lot of the caring roles involve a lot of a, a, an erasure of your identity as a, as a person, as an individual that women particularly un undergo. So even some small snippets of time. Um, I talk to a lot of women who say, well, I haven't got time to take up a new hobby. And I suppose it's not really about kind of allotting half a day to doing some art or something. It's more have that five minute walk, enjoy that chocolate bar. You know, don't just kind of scoff it while you're doing something else have a moment with it and have bring some everyday mindfulness to your life um, and the other thing is sleep and that is one of the real uh, make or breaks for a lot of uh, certainly perinatal mental health is sleep um, so the best thing that partners can do um, or people around that woman who is struggling is to try and protect that woman's sleep in, in whatever way that might that might be it's can be quite difficult to put in practice, but even a couple of hours here and there makes a huge difference. Okay. There's a, um, <clears throat> the time thing I was reading about, I'm not too sure it's evidence, but there's a Goldilocks rule around time for women, where it's uh, suggesting um, that less than two hours mm -hmm. is not, en not enough, and more than five hours is too much. So between two and five hours a day, is, a, is just about right in terms of the porridge analogy um, for time. So I think that can be a really helpful, I found that quite useful to check in and thought, do I have between two and five hours a day over the week of time where I can make choices about what I do or, or what I engage in? And if it's less than two, for people that just like to have a bit of a, a line in the sand, that can be quite an interesting mm -hmm check in and thinking, well, no, I've got less than two hours a day. I, no wonder I'm feeling overwhelmed or, mm -hmm. you know, unable to balance my day. So um, I found that quite helpful as a kind of a rule um, or as a guideline to think about in terms of time and what, what you do with it. So, as we've done before, what's been really helpful for us is to get some questions from our viewers as well. So we've got a, a few that have been sent in. So I'm going to just run through these one at a time and just to get your views and, and ideas uh, from the questions, okay? So the first questions came in from Carmel via Instagram and she wants us to ask around mood swings and anxiety uh, around periods. So um, I'm going to come to you first on this. So what effect does menstruation have on women's mental health and what can women do to help manage any anxiety during this time? So I think mood swings are a very recognised um, reaction to, um, to menstruation and that time in the month. Um, so it's quite common, but it doesn't make it easy to manage. So um, that, that's to validate that. I think it's learning to recognise what that means for you. So some people find it really helpful to have diaries where they maybe record their thoughts or what kind of mood. So you might rate your mood on a scale of 0 to 10 during certain times of the month. And then you can normalise um, that during this, this time, I'm probably operating at this number, which is normal for me. So let's just make sure I don't schedule anything really important. I've got to make a big decision on around that time. Um, some people reach for the sugar to help them. So do you want to manage that? Um, <clears throat> I think it's getting to understand how you react and what that means for you. And, and can you maybe plan or prepare some things to help yourself when you're feeling a bit more um, stable for you and, and what you might say to yourself then to help you during those few days where you feel a little bit different. Um, but it's completely normal and 
I think I think it's it's okay to say it out loud to people. I think that can take the edge off it a little bit. If you can just say, you know what, today is a really not a good day for me. I'm feeling really whatever word may may make sense for you, and that in itself can help dissipate it. Or you've shared it, therefore you don't have to hide it. Therefore people understand. Um, so it's getting a little plan together around how are you going to respond and be prepared because I'm guessing probably it happens quite regularly. Um, so um, that would be my my suggestions. Yeah, uh, my experience is what my patients have told me, mm -hmm. what I have read, or what my family members have told me, because I fully recognize, I think it was a few years ago, where I always recognized, but then I learned that I can only understand it, I can't experience it. So I don't know what it goes on with it, but we know from evidence a few parts. So I generally look at three things in this, and that's what I would say Carmen as well with mood swings and menstruation, because it is a real biological, fast psychological thing. It's not made up uh, with that. Is One is nearly 70% or more uh, women who go through menstrual cycles because of uh, reproductive organs experience premenstrual symptoms. That's part and parcel of their uh, experiences. But then that's regular. They manage, they cope, and they deal with it. And they're pretty capable of doing that because it's about them. But then there is another group where during those episodes or periods or monthly uh, periods and others, as you mentioned, will get premenstrual uh, symptoms or we call PMS or more severe end, which is premenstrual dysphoric disorder, uh, which is what I manage and see in my clinics and others. Now that is you cannot uh, uh, minimize the impact of that. And that is a real condition, which is a serious uh, mood disorder, which is different to just having mood swings, which dissipates. So mm. that's important to differentiate. But the third group that I get involved with is where they already have serious mental illnesses like bipolar illnesses, maybe ADHD, which is impacting other aspects of life, uh, depression and others. And the cycles change the way they uh, experience the impact of it not only on a monthly basis or weekly basis, it could be on a daily basis as well. And that's what gets minimized, misdiagnosed, mismanaged. So we need to look at all three uh, areas and identify which groups one would be so you can get the right support and help uh, uh, and at the right time. Uh, just, sorry, but just to cut in one more time, I just wanted to mention there are quite a few, this is true for all women that are going through hormonal changes. And there's quite a few groups that are often missed. One of those are people going through fertility treatment. They're often missed from these discussions, but of course the exogenous hormones have the same effect on women. Um, the other is having a baby, but also when you lose a baby, uh, there is a significant hormonal shift that happens at that point as well, especially when you're not breastfeeding and that they can be a very difficult uh, group to access because they feel they no longer should be accessing obstetric services um, or be suffering in the same sort of way, but they absolutely are. Uh, and the other again is, is women um, menopausal but might be going through HRT or even kind of some kind of cancer therapies or steroid treatments and things like that. So these are all groups of women that any kind of exogenous hormones absolutely will be causing the same sort of symptoms. Mm. Brilliant, thank you. Carmel, I hope that was really helpful because it yeah, thanks guys, that's really, really useful answers. The the next one, and, and Victor, I'm gonna to come to you for this one, which is from Frankie. And Frankie asks us, how do eating disorders interplay with mental health issues, especially in women? There's a massive interplay between eating and mental health. If we look at kind of uh, depression and anxiety, that can make you feel too sick to eat. It may reduce your appetite, um, all the way through to thinking about body image issues and thinking that you're fat um, or struggling to have the sensations a lot of the time of eating it itself, the textures and, and process of it. And obviously mental health and eating disorders have a, an interplay between them that is completely in extrinsic. I, I don't think they can be unwrapped. Mm. Also, when you treat a lot of mental health disorders, you rely on the coping strategies that you've used in your past to manage that stress. Um, and for pe people with eating disorders or disordered eating, they, the, the, it can make things worse in that aspect before they get better. So a lot of the times we try and restrict coping strategies such as suicidal thoughts or self-harming, and then that increases the um, eating disorder symptoms. 
uh, before we can you know, help somebody learn more adaptive coping skills. It's a very difficult area to treat um, sometimes. And what is most difficult, I think, is navigating circumstances. Because I think a lot of women find themselves in a rock and a hard place because a lot of mental health services exclude eating disorders and a lot of eating disorder services exclude mental health disorders. So um, it can feel like uh, you're kind of falling through the net. Uh, and I think that makes things even more difficult when you're going through that very stressful period. So this next one's from Alison, and uh, she's written in to say, I have a busy, high-powered job, which is often very stressful. I don't always know how to ask my family for help and support. What's the panel's advice? So, Debbie, let's start with yourself there. Yeah, I should think this is probably um, reasonably common out there, because lots of women do have high-powered jobs. Um, and um, so many questions about, you know, what would you... One of the things that can be quite helpful is what would you say to a friend? So if a friend had come to Alison and said, here's my situation, what do you think I should do? Um, then I wonder if what she, the advice that she might offer to her friend might be different to how she's engaging with her own challenge. Um, so maybe that might be helpful to think about. Um, I mean, honesty and, um, and finding the right words can be really powerful in itself. And, and I think showing vulnerability is, um, when it's done at the right time and with the right people in the right environment can be really powerful. So I think it's um, maybe checking why why she feels she can't say it. Is it because of how she's been brought up? Is it because of her work um, expectations? Is it because of fear of what someone's going to say and the, and the implications that might have? And if she, can, if she can unpick the reasons why what she's predicting might happen, that might help her know what she needs to focus on and how to word things. And I would suggest that she practices um, on a friend that she trusts first to see if I said this to you, what would you hear me say or what what would you imply or what would you assume I'm saying? And then she can then get someone's feedback on, on the language that she's using and then she can adjust it if she wants to. Um, but I would really, um, really hope that she manages to find a way of saying something rather than not saying something mm -hmm. because that is when things will start to spiral and then we will generally find unhelpful coping strategies to deal with that uncontained stressful issue and that will then become even worse so i hope she finds a way of, of of saying something so thank you so much for the panel for joining me today that was absolutely fantastic and i really hope that all of our viewers have really got something out of that when we've been talking about and understanding about the issues related to women's mental health now if you have enjoyed today's please do like this so we want to get our message out there as far and wide as we possibly can and also, if you want to know when we're getting our new episodes, we'll be dropping them. Please do subscribe to our channel and you'll get all the updates as soon as they're out there. So thank you very much for watching today. <laughs>